City of Stevens Point Board of Park Commissioners Meeting, recorded January 5, 2022. Well, it's 6.30 and we have a quorum, so let's begin the January 5th Park Board meeting, please. And, um, Director, would you do the roll, roll call, please? You bet. Freckman? Here. Kwiatkowski is not here yet. Paul? Here. Kirsch is excused. McDonald? Here. O'Connick? Here. Shabilsky? Here. Alder Shore is not here yet. Slinsky is excused. Sorensen? Here. And Alder Zerzua? Here. We have a quorum. Great. Um, item number two, approval of December 1st, 2021 meeting minutes. I'll move. I'll second. Motion and a second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Okay, the um, minutes were approved. Item number three, approval of U.S. cellular cell tower upgrade in Gurkee Park. Director? This is uh, mostly a housekeeping item. So we have a long-term lease for a cell tower in Gurkee Park with U.S. Cellular. Our lease language includes language that states we will work with them and not unreasonably deny upgrades. This upgrade, they did a more major upgrade, you might recall, about a year and a half ago. Uh, this, was to, this one here is to just basically install three radios with built-in antennas, one um, ray cap is what they call it, and one hybrid cable. So it's just some hardware components that are being changed. They have provided an escrow check like they've done in the past. It's been reviewed by SEH, which is our independent reviewer, make sure it's structurally okay for the tower, not gonna cause any impact. So staff is recommending approval so they can go ahead and do this upgrade to that tower uh, basically sometime here in the spring. Okay, uh, I'll move the approval. All right, it's, approval has been moved by Bob Freckman. Second. Second by Sue Hall. Is there any further discussion or questions for, for the director? Okay, if not, all those in favor of approval, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, all, it has been approved. Item number four, approval of playground and site work donation for Atwell Park playground area. Okay, so I think last month I mentioned in the director's report that I had been working with a family who would like to, who was interested in making a donation for a neighborhood park. So the donation, the, the family has asked to not get into the specifics of the dollar amount, but I'd like to kind of present what they're offering to donate to the park. Uh, they did have a family member that lived in this neighborhood, and they'd like to pay some tribute to that family member who's passed, and the family's graciously offered to the city to ultimately install a two to five year old playground set adjacent, adjacent, oops, I'm going the wrong way, adjacent the set that's there currently. So the, the donation amount's not enough to do a whole entire playground, but it's enough to install something that would basically be an accessory to the five to 12 year old set that's there now. And it's designed in a way that when we go to replace the bigger set in the next five to seven to eight years, depending upon how the budget works, we can place a new set and it'll be, it'll be jived together. So it'll work for the next hopefully 30 years. So what you'll see here is the donation would cover this two to five year old set, the engineered wood fibers that would go around it to make it safe, installation of it, and it also would include <coughs> installing an accessible concrete approach that would come off of Lindbergh Avenue that we currently do not have. So if, again, that would help with anyone that would be mobility impaired to get uh, next to the playground. And additionally, there'll be a, a memorial or celebration bench like we do for our program that would be located here. And the, the donation would cover all of that. In addition, provide a few thousand dollars for maintenance of the set after it was installed. So the family is very interested in, in seeing it be maintained too and they want to help the city not become a burden. So tonight, staff is recommending that we do proceed, proceed with the installation and the acceptance of the donation. And what would happen is our city crew would ultimately excavate the site. There's one small Tadsa Kentucky coffee tree that we would relocate with our tree spade in the park. It's, it's not a mature tree. It's something that's been planted in the last few years. We would put this in and then again, when the larger set comes due in the future year, we would finish it and then we would wrap it with that, that concrete wrap like we did in Buchholz and are gonna do in Iverson. So it'd be consistent with kind of our new look for some of these for access. The celebration bench will sit in this corner so that you can kind of look at both sets ultimately if you're sitting and watching your child, your child play. So that's the plan and, and that's what staff is recommending approval this evening. And it, it's from um, Clark and Diane Slifer is the, uh, is the people that are, that are offering this to the city. Well, what a generous offer. It's really wonderful. I'll make a motion to accept the uh, um, 
donation for the playground and site work at Atwell Park. And I'd second that. Great. <clears throat> um, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor of approving the playground and site work donation for Atwell Park, please signify by saying aye. 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 I can't believe there'd be any opposition, but if there's any opposition, <laughs> okay, thank you. And thank you so much to that to the family. We have. What to, was the family's name? Uh, it's Clark and Diane Slifer is the name. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Um, okay, item number five, Parks, Recreation, and Forestry Department non-residency policy. So last month, the board made the motion and put into place the non-resident policy for the lodges, which was new. Uh, but then just adopted what we had been doing for the non-residents. But there was some discussion about what the actual numbers are that we're having for non-residents. In addition to, we had not written it in really a, a, a policy, We'd written it into a format where it can hopefully you know, transcend for years and years as we go. So the first thing I wanted to call attention to was just what we had for last rental season at, the, uh, at our lodges. So if you actually look down, you'll see the percentages out of the 245 throughout the lodges, you can see that we ran uh, percentage-wise, 71% was non-residents at the Boy Scout Lodge, 68% at Buchholz, 80% at the Girl Scout Lodge, 73 at Iverson. Piffner was 56, which was really the best. You see the 100% at the rec center, that's because we didn't have a lot of rentals there during the mm -hmm. summer. So you can see it's pretty substantial that we have quite a few non-residents that are using the facility. So that's the first thing I wanted to bring to the board's attention. The next thing was there was discussion about what are other communities doing around us. So we did go through and called them, asked, and you'll see it's all over the board. Some are one and a half times, some are two, some are saying they're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And the further we cast that net, if you get down in the Madison region or Milwaukee region, the closer the, closer the neighborhoods are that have park and rec departments, the more you'll see the fees increase because more non-residents go across the boundary because they live close mm -hmm. and have park and recs that are closer. Here, we are a little further away than, than you are when you're in a major metro area. So, but as you can see, there is non-residence. It's not uncommon. You know, it's almost more common to see that the other locations are doing something. What I drafted up uh, within this, so that was information, and if I could provide anything else, I'm happy to. What I did draft up was kind of a written policy that, that I'm gonna summarize here. Basically states, if you live in the city's corporate boundary, your property taxes help support the Park Rec and Forestry Department and what we do. If you live outside the corporate boundary, you might be a school district resident, but you're not a city resident. Therefore, the park commission can put a fee in, which we have in certain areas, but the policy does not state a specific fee. The reason I wrote it this way is it allows then the annual review of fees, which you all do now, you can always say, hey, what about something new we're doing? We should put a non-resident fee on it, and we could do that. So this just states basically that if it's something that we offer through the park record forestry department, a fee can be applied. Then I made a separate page in the packet that shows what fees we were, would be actually applying based on the last motion last month. And that would be a dollar for the pool admission or for our KB Willard admissions, a $10 difference for a season pass between a family or individual, and then those lodge slips, which are 25, and $100 for the boat slips. The only thing on this that we weren't really doing before was lodge rentals, in addition to asking when people come into the pool and things, are you a resident or not a resident? So I'm happy to answer any questions, but otherwise staff recommendation is to adopt the policy. It really just gives the teeth to what we took action on last month. I'll make a motion to accept the changes, or I guess the noted changes. And okay. Alder Zarazua, did you have a, were you seconding or? Yes. I have, um, if anybody has any questions or discussion, Dan, you did say that we would review these fees every year then in addition to all the other fees that we review? Yes, it will come there in our fees and charges. They're spelled out, so okay. it will be there every year. Well, I think that's really good because uh, now in retrospect, that $25 seems pretty cheap for a resident, non-resident on our, our, our rentals, um, especially when you look at the number of non-residents that are renting them. And I think it kind of speaks to the probably lack of other venues that are located in this area, plus the attractiveness of places like Piffner Park, Buchholz Park for weddings, family reunions, and that kind of thing. So um, I think we need to be reviewing that or continue to review that. Definitely. I should add one more thing I forgot to mention. This is a new fee, right, since it went into place. So I'm working with the comptroller's office right now, based on some of our discussions, to have the $25 additional put into a reserve fund so it can be used for park, rec, and forestry activities. So we can't impact other revenue that goes in the general fund. That's already funding things we're doing. 
but this will be some a new revenue stream. So they're working that part of the accounting out. We intend to deposit that in a separate account, and then that can be used, hopefully, if we're doing upgrades to those lodges or other things as the fund grows. Based on the numbers we have, you know, it'll be a few thousand dollars a year. So over some time, there'll be a little bit of money there that can be utilized. So that's the intention right now is to put this in a separate, a separate pot. Oh, great. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I know I was shocked to look at the, the numbers on the, the non-resident use and seeing that all majority non-resident use. Um, when you talked, when staff talked to other communities in surrounding areas, when they introduced, I don't know if they've had these policies uh, for non-resident uh, fees for a while or if they're new, was there ever any pushback from non-residents that, uh, well, if you're going to charge us extra, we're not going to do it, we're going to go somewhere else? I mean, is that something you anticipate? Or have you heard of anybody else running into that? So they didn't share that with us, uh, but I will tell you just from my previous positions, it's not uncommon when the fee goes in place that to, for the question to come up, why do I have to pay more? And it, it really does focus where we'll have to explain, well, this is why, yeah. you know, how it sets up. I'm not familiar in my own experience where that's turned people away because it's never been substantial enough. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, like, it's a $100 fee difference for the boat slips, but it's so competitive, people don't even, like, blink an eye at it. And I think we only actually have one non-resident in that right now. But uh, so I think, I think the value is still there based on the demand because I should have also mentioned there was not a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday that was not rented last year at Piffner or all, the all-purpose building or at Buchholz. There's, there's tremendous demand, I think, too. So um, I think we might get some comments, but I think that we've, get, we've got more demand than usage or uh, availability, and mm -hmm. I think that'll probably make up for it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, we discussed fees at uh, the boat landings. Not per se, I guess. I guess any fee, it wasn't a resident, non-resident fee, but obviously people came out in large numbers to object to that. Well, uh, Dan, you brought up something interesting, too, because you said of the, pre the pressures or the desire to rent the, those buildings on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we might even look eventually, not now, but when we look at, at the fees again, maybe looking at differential for a weekend. Sure. So anyway, any further discussion? I, I guess, Dan, I've got a question. <laughs> I, the, I was really stunned by the low number of resident rentals. Is that is that normal and i know you're relatively new but are we are we actually disadvantaging our our residents of the city because out of out of out of city residents are getting in early and is that something that we need to address at some point i think it's a fair question to say that if i think going off just one sample year is difficult because we did have some people mm -hmm. that rolled back uh, but i think right. for example if we came back next year and said what's 2022 do I think we do have the ability, if we ever wanted to, to say we're going to give residents a week, you know, earlier. Or you know, we can set the system to do that. Right now, how the old policy of how rentals worked is you could on January first you could rent that year is how it worked. Now, because of our digital system, we have the ability to allow you to rent a year in advance. So essentially, people can be looking at the calendar. So when people are calling and asking, we say, "Yep, if you watch the calendar, you can go a year and a half out." So we could look at changing the sequence of how we offer it to the public too. I, you know, I think it's worth it. I was, again, I was shocked by the disparity, to be quite honest. And mm -hmm. I, on the upside, I mean, if these numbers come in in 2022, that's another $4,200 in rental revenue. That go, and I love the idea of the, of the segregated fund to, to have a bit of a reinvestment fund for park facilities or whether it's shelters or whatever the case may be. But I'm struck by the disparity between the non-resident resident rental rate. And that, to me, that's a little bit of a concern. You know, I think there is an issue of perceived uh, fairness. Uh, on the one hand, you've got the people that are paying the taxes locally, and uh, I think their sense of fairness is I should get something special for that so somebody that's not contributing shouldn't get the same benefit. And on the other hand, people who are not part of the community, they can look at it and say, well, that's a fair amount. Or they can say, hey, you're, 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 you're just trying to get in a few extra bucks, take advantage of the situation. So that's why I think comparability is, is a fairly important thing, too. And it, 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 it seems to me that I think we've, we have a good track record as far as being fair. And uh, I think that this is perfectly reasonable. But that's always got to be something that enters into our decisions. Okay. Um, 
We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or can we call the question? Okay, all those in favor of implementing this policy, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you for the staff work on that. Yeah. Um, item number six, Piffner Pioneer Park Banshell. So the Banshell is our prized uh, possession, as we know. It's, it's the busiest area we have in the summer for events, and it's, it's been there a long time. And where we're at now is we were aware of a couple things we were investigating. And essentially what we had noticed is with some of the uptick we had um, with people that were, were frequenting the Banshell last summer, we had spent a little bit more time cleaning in there and getting into some more of the corners. And we noticed on the arch, one of the support arches, that there was some corrosion going on. And the, I think it's glalum is how you say it, structure had a part where it was a little bit ho hollowed out. So that was when we started to investigate and see what our options were. And it's not as widespread of people in the area that specialize working with that material. So we ended up working with a structural engineer. That, that report began in the fall, it's about the time we started looking into it, and we got the report back right after the capital budget was kind of finalizing for 2022. In the report, the pictures that kind of show it, it really called attention to a few primary areas. The first one is when the addition was put on the building in 2002, I think it was, and I, if I get these dates wrong, I'm sorry, they're in the report, I think it was 2002. Built in 74, 2002, I think is when the addition went on the roof was redone. And I think since then, we've not done a different roof attachment. And they showed that basically the way that the support beams or the trusses of that area, the span, it was starting to show some of the under the roof underlayment um, heating a little bit, and it was starting to put some stress on the rubber. So they called out that the roof was something that needs to be looked at, and there's probably some underdecking that needs to be done. And that said, that's something that needs to be done sooner than later. In addition to that, it called out that the rafters that are exposed that come out over top of, say, a performance or somebody that's on the band shell itself are exposed. So they're starting to weather heavy on the ends of the actual wood itself. And then there's things that are fastened to that because prior to when, you know, music went to all these loud, you know, big speaker systems that get set up, it used to be rigged off of some of the things attached to the rafters. That's actually not used anymore at this point. They're just still there where the attachments used to happen. So the, the structural engineer said that should be something that's basically either cut back and then covered, or it could be replaced and then covered to keep it out of the elements. Most importantly, though, going to that archway, it called out that we need to do something to either fix it, put something on both ends of it to remake it structurally supportive, but we have to look, take care of that hollowing so that it doesn't continue to go that way. It is a pressing issue because it's not something we can just wait for because they don't really know based on the way it's set up, you know, how many, how long we have. So what you'll see is it talked about in a major windstorm, something over 50 miles per hour, they didn't recommend we have a bunch of people underneath the band shell. And it said that we should look at doing some replacements or fixes sooner than, sooner than later. So we had just gotten that. We were waiting for some cost estimates to come to the park commission. And lo and behold, we had that really nasty windstorm here in December. And when that happened, you saw the photos that actually peeled back part of the roof in a different spot. It went off the front, it, it peeled the drip edge off, and it peeled that rubber membrane back. We ended up spending a couple thousand dollars to get that covered back up so that we didn't have the snow and moisture going and ruin the underlayment of the roof. So where does that leave us today, essentially? We've talked with the comptroller's office and, and the mayor's office, and we've gone through this with staff. We need to move on this, essentially. Because each area is really a different specialist, so we need really a roofing person involved, we need probably somebody either in that glalum that can work with that or somebody with a metal fabricator who can uh, morph a piece that the structural engineer designs. We believe that the best move is to move forward with really a design of all of the repairs and then bidding it out. That will give us an actual cost estimate, and because we've not got a dollar amount in our capital budget, our intention is at that point we would seek funding through the Finance Committee and the Comptroller's Office or the city does budget some dollars towards unbudgeted repairs. So if it came in at less money than we think, it could be something that maybe could be worked into the budget. So at this point, we move forward, and CBS Squared has just begun doing the design for the repairs. And then this will be something that will come back, likely to Park Commission, on the Finance and Council, depending upon the severity of it. But we are looking to move on this in 22, so that we don't have to displace any of our major events that do go on there from Levitt Amp to you know, Riverfront Rendezvous to all of the other community celebrations that do happen. So uh, good news is this structure has been tried, true, and trusty for a long time, and we hope it will be again. We're just gonna touch up a couple of these areas to make sure it's safe for the public. Do you need a motion? 
motion from us or in this I, at this point it's just information I, because of uh, we did already authorize CBS squared to move forward and we worked at the comptroller office for the funding of that piece so that's moving forward but when we get to the construction side of it after we bid it out uh, there'll be another piece that comes back likely through Park Commission and that's where we'll be acting, asking for actual action well, thank you for the report. Thanks, Dan. I have a question. Oh. Can, can so, I ask a question? So, okay, in, in our report that you gave us, it says that um, <clears throat> uh, the decking the failures due to structural overload or improper installation. You, does that mean that's proper that they were questioning the proper installation when we built this in 1972, or the latest one when the roof was replaced? Uh, the latest one. So they were wondering about the, the <clears throat> span between the trusses on the addition. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, they actually, in the original report, the original structure from the 1970, there's no issues with the roof until this recent windstorm. That's where it peeled back. But before that, there was nothing observed that was causing any problems there. So that original structure has done exactly what it, <coughs> what it should have did, so. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Um, item number, number seven, approval of 2022 tree removal and trimming contract. So Todd uh, Forrester, the forestry superintendent, Todd Ernst, is on the call, and he also provided a memo to this. Um, Todd, do you want to give a little history on kind of how this contract, how we work this every year, and then make the recommendation for approval? Okay. Yep. Um, every year we submit um, for quotes um, the tree, uh, tree work contract. Uh, it's primarily tree removal, the large tree removal that, um, um, that needs some more staff than we really have. And um, and the, the stump removal. That's that's the gist of it. They do help with some trimming, um, and uh, it's historically gone between about three or four different companies. In the last couple of years, the Blusky Brothers has gotten it, and they've done a they've done a good job for us. Uh, question for you, Todd. Is sure. this per tree type estimate? I'm assuming whatever we have can be less than this. This is just the budget amount. For removals, is it? I'm sorry, John. What was that? So obviously, you don't know what how many trees are going to be removing. Is there a cost? This is a budgeted amount, I assume. So this that's a budgeted amount. Yes, yeah. And when the money's used up, <coughs> um, then, then we're done. Like I said, it, and it's been enough the last couple of years. And I mean, it's, it's been historically, it's been enough. And their price per tree has not changed from 21. Also, or is it nope. just historic? Um, at like when we when I go to the Wisconsin Arborist Association meetings, they laugh at how cheap we get our rates for. The state average is about two to three times this is from what we're paying for whatever reason. I'll make a motion to accept. Okay, a second somewhere. I'll second. Okay, seconded by Bob Freckman. Uh, all those in favor of approving the 2022 tree removal and trimming contract, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any any opposed? Okay, thank you. That is approved. Item number eight: review of twenty-five thousand dollar urban forestry grant award and twenty twenty-one forestry department accomplishments. So before I turn it over to Todd, I, I do want to we, number one. This is the best news you can have. So yeah. Todd spent a great <laughs> amount of time, uh, him and his staff, putting together an application. I think you might have Rick saw if you in the council agenda. We had a resolution to authorize the application earlier this year, um, but successfully Todd and his team were able to acquire a twenty-five thousand dollar grant, and that's the part we receive. Um, so we, that's that's the basically dollar value we're going to get. So it's a tremendous. Uh, tremendous grants, a tremendous tribute to, to our talented forestry department. I think it's the best in the state. Uh, Todd and his team do a great job. But in addition, if you look at the actual uh, piece in the packet, it's the largest in our region. So if you look at who, what they awarded for our region itself, um, the next closest was 23, but after that they go down. So we're, at, again, our department is leading the pack. Todd talked about kind of state averages, but I think it's because of what, what a good job they do with outreach and working around as well as a lot of our resources are then shared with the state for other departments. So kudos to Todd and his team. And uh, he did work on a number of other things that talked about some accomplishments for the year. So these things really mended together. So uh, Todd, great job. We wanted to make sure the Park Commission knew. And if you want to go ahead and cover the rest of the accomplishments, um, I'll stop talking. <laughs> Oh um, yeah, the, the grant is just uh, we uh, updated the existing tree planting spots um, the last couple of years, and now what we're going to do is we're going to take we're going to try to inventory all the vacant vacant tree planting spots um, 
So that once we get that all put together, then we'll be able to put together a really good street tree management plan, which should be updated hopefully next year. So that that that's the part that I'm most excited about with um, with that. Um, with that said, um, our accomplishments that we got that, that are that our forestry department and with the help of the parks department, um, uh, we had a good year. Uh, it was the 40th year that we are at Tree City USA, which is which is something to be very proud of. Um, we received our 17th Growth Award. Uh, we had an uh, Earth Day celebration where we planted 25 fruit trees out at uh, the NCCT property, uh, which is connected to Buco Park. And then we had an Arbor Day celebration where we uh, worked out by Skyward and put, I think it was like 25 maples out there. Um, we planted a total of, between our staff and our contractors, we planted 438 trees, uh, which is a good amount for our department. And uh, the big thing there is, um, I, even though that's a lot of trees, um, uh, we got a second, well, we have a third water tanker, so now we can really help with uh, keep maintaining a few more trees because we never want to put more trees in than we could take care of, not just from watering, but trimming and everything. So um, that, that was a good addition, the water tanker. Um, we got that last year. Um, with that, our forestry staff also planted, uh, uh, pruned and so 2, 000, over 2,000 uh, street trees. Um, and a lot of that was our structural pruning. That's pruning the, the small trees. So once they get larger, we don't have to invest as much money in pruning, uh, pruning those trees. And it also helps from a, a structural um, uh, status too. And then we removed about 106 trees throughout the, along the city streets and in the parks. Um, I have 106 plus because a lot of times we're going along some of the rural, um, rural roads like Old Wausau Road and um, in, the, um, in some of the parks where they're more wooded. And uh, we just, we've taken down a lot of trees in there. So um, it's mainly the 106 is um, from managed areas of our parks along the streets and in our managed parts of the parks. Uh, we installed, an, uh, I think, a really neat playground set over at Bucol Park. Uh, we had the tennis courts renovated at Gurky. I think that's really nice. And uh, we had the Union Cemetery sign that uh, was, was found. And that uh, uh, some people are very excited about that. <laughs> Uh, we also did a lot of work with um, uh, prairie plants this year. Uh, we had a, uh, the Central Wisconsin Wild Ones did a very nice planting along Piffner Park, and uh, the Audubon Society helped again without a Kuskie Park. And at both sites also, we did a lot of invasive plant removal. Um, and I guess the other thing I just wanted to highlight is when I look back and I kind of look back at what we did is we worked with a lot of different groups um, we worked with the Central Wisconsin Wild Ones, the Audubon Society, uh, NCCT, the Wisconsin River Academy, the Master Gardeners, the Boy Scouts, different groups at UWSP, at MSTC, Farm Shed, and just a, a number of citizens. So I think for a, for a smaller department, I think we worked with a lot of different um, community groups. So I was um, very happy about that. So um, that's kind of what I had in a nutshell. <laughs> Oh, and I guess that? there's one thing I want to say. I guess it was more targeted to, to Bob Breckman. Uh, Bob gave me a little walk out by his property, and there was a really neat tree head out there, a Cobus uh, magnolia. And I've been spending like the last three or four weeks trying to find one of those trees, even just a seedling. And uh, just before I got in, I was looking at my email, and I think I found one, Bob. So oh, great. I, I found it great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, so, a, it's a remarkable I'm, I'm tree. Actually, I'm, yeah, I'm actually very excited about it. So um, <laughs> it's Heritage Nursery out of Oregon. So um, I'll, I'll see. I'm, I'm hopeful that that goes through, and we'll have a few more of those trees in town then. Yeah. So if, if there's any questions, um, I can answer them, but that, that's just what um, that's just what our – our department um, with the forestry and the parks department have accomplished. All right. Well, congratulations, Todd, and thank you for you and your staff, all the great work that you've done in the community. It's appreciated. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Todd? Okay, we're good. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Uh, item number nine, review of other volunteer service opportunities for park commissioners. 
So I can take this one. Um, there's a couple things that go on that um, actually John O'Connick has been doing for quite a long time. But um, we wanted to, uh, Chair McDonald and I talked about talking about a couple of the opportunities just to bring them up so that as time goes on or if someone's interested sooner than later, um, they're made aware. So the biggest one I think that probably goes back the furthest is probably the Deer Committee. Is, is that fair? Mm -hmm. So the Deer Committee or Deer Management Committee, um, the city does do a program where we manage and ultimately have a contractor that helps take out or keep the, not take out, keeps the, the deer population in check in the, in the community. And then that, uh, those, the meat from the deer are actually taken to a local processor and then they're given to a food pantry. So it's a tremendous program for uh, really a, a resource that can become a nuisance and uh, we're able to manage it. So, and John can speak to more details of it, but I think you said it's been over yeah. 10 years. So um, that's one position that the committee, I think, would have interest in anyone that would have interest in maybe being part of it. And eventually, I'm sure John would probably not mind handing that role over at some point. So that's, that's one of them. Um, additionally, this year, we're going to be having the comprehensive outdoor recreation plan that's in our capital budget. And um, I, I spoke with the chair, with Chair McDonald. We talked about a subcommittee maybe helping with that so that rather than bringing maybe every month something here in, in great detail, the subcommittee could help provide some direction and go through that, and then we could do updates at the Park Commission and then bring the major milestones. So maybe after the surveys are done, um, when some of the projects go in. So there'll be a 2022 opportunity to be on a subcommittee for the Comprehensive Outdoor Rec Plan. Um, the other one I, I think uh, is, it, I should mention that the Deer Committee is appointed by the mayor, but typically it's been somebody from the Park Commission or volunteer oriented, so someone that would express interest. Uh, the mayor can be the one that appoints it. And then I think the other big one that we wanted to mention is that uh, John is also the chair of the Tourism Commission. So he's been on that, which is now related by state statute to a grant application process that uh, my office is the liaison to. So that's how the Parks Department's involved. And then the Tourism Commission meets to decide how room tax dollars are spread out through the community. So that's uh, the main areas. And then I don't know if, if either Chair or, or John, if you want to mention more about what it entails. No. I, I, yeah, I'm Tourism Committee, we, we meet uh, two, three times a year. And with the Deer uh, Committee, we probably meet maybe four times a year, uh, more active in the fall when we do our, have our contractor do the culling. I had brought it up because I thought it would be a good way for some of the newer uh, members of the Park Commission to uh, get involved and find out a little bit more of the behind the scenes of what goes on with bo both the Park Department and then some of the things that we get involved in, in as part of the community. So um, I know we're not totally represented here tonight, but perhaps if people want to think about it and uh, maybe get more information from John or from Dan, and then let Dan know what your, where your interest might lie. And here. Just a question or comment. So the Deer Committee also dealt with the geese, right? <laughs> so just to, just because it surprised me, it wasn't just deer, so. A few other things too. Yeah, <laughs> in a way that's kind of a pseudo wildlife management committee in a, in a certain capacity. Very good point. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Name, because that's all. Yeah. Deer, or, I mean, deer have been perhaps a lesser problem than the geese have been in the last several years. So that's a really good point. So deer and company. Yeah. <laughs> deer, deer and others. T-shirts made, John. Yeah. 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 Deer and others. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. You bet. Uh, item number 10, the director's report. Okay, just a couple items this month. Number one, we are back to full staff, if, there's, if there finally is such a thing. We just brought... <laughs> Angela Lamaran is our new administrative assistant. So Angela will be, Angie is what she goes by, will be joining us for one of the next couple meetings here at some point. Uh, with the holiday season and everything going on, I, I, I didn't ask her to come to this first meeting. So, But Angie did begin her duties last week, so she's now with us and she's kind of getting up to speed on all the things that Anne used to do before she transitioned into her other role. So we're really excited about having Angie on board. Angie's previous role was with Recycle Connection, so she was in town here and is pretty familiar with the, with the community and, and many things within it. So. Um, she brings a really great skill set for us. Additionally, we're at the time of the year where we're finally able to say winter sports is open. Um, <laughs> we, we did have to limp through with a few staff. We're a little bit short there, but we do have a toboggan run open. We were able to be open the entire winter break and, and actually did really well. We had a lot of people that utilized it. I actually just did a deposit from the weekend of $1,500 of people that came and rented toboggans and bought hot chocolate and things. So, great. And that's not counting all the people that just come and sled and don't spend money either. Uh, we had a really, a, it was a great season of the holiday season for that. Our ice rinks delayed a little bit because of those warm temperatures. We did officially flip the switch today and say they're open to the public. So Northward Pedal and Paddle is in Gerke Park. 
they're offering anything from ice skate rentals to broom ball rentals to hockey pucks, hockey sticks. They've got it all. So unfortunately, they missed the window of the busiest time with the holiday season, but uh, they are going to be there now daily as well as on the weekends. So are they doing Iverson as well? They are not doing Iverson. They, uh, you can rent skates and go other places, though. So their rental is full encompassing of the whole community. So there's a, a way to take it if you want to go downtown or you want to go to Iverson or any other location. So Who is doing that? Northward Pedal and Paddle. Oh, so okay. So we had the lease agreement, I think. It was probably okay. last summer, I think. Where are they located at? Okay. Yeah. They're in the warming house in Gerke Park. Okay. So 5 to 9 on weeknights, except uh, on Saturdays it's 12 to 8, and Sundays it's 12 to 5. So we just put the social media posts out, I think, about 4 o'clock today. And Patrick will be doing a number of things down there. And uh, he's got the warming house kind of decked out. He's got a TV in there, and he's got it warm and stuff. So it's a nice place. Hopefully, you know, families can go down. And we do get a lot of requests for outdoor skate rentals. So now we're just referring right. them right to Patrick. And we're hoping that that will be a good conduit for him to, to, to keep going with that. So other than that, now that we've got the main rinks up, you know, we had snow today, but we'll start working on our, I call them kind of second-tier rinks. So we'll move into the Emerson Parks of the world as well as out this year for the first year at East Oaks Park. So those will be the next two rinks we want to get up and running for some of the other neighborhoods. Um, we do have a, a big focus of ice rinks down in this corner of the city, so having one on that east side should be really nice for those that, uh, especially young children and stuff that can't, you know, maybe get a ride or things of that nature. So other than that, we're just dealing with snow and getting ready. The Willet is, will be coming back now after the holiday season with games and things. Um, obviously, with, with the with the spread of you know COVID stuff, we're trying to work through all these protocols as best we can and deal with it as best we can. So um, that's where we're at right now. Is the downtown ice rink open? It is also open, yep. And that one actually did make it way before because, believe it or not, by being able to put that in the liner, we basically fill it up like a pool and we let it <laughs> freeze in. That one survives it much better than when we have to put it on the ground. So that have one we, was the first one up. Have we thought about buying the liner and trying that on our bigger rinks? You'd need such a big liner, it, it, it wouldn't work. Because that one we're able to buy a silage tarp is actually what we use. And it's one piece and it fills up out here with how big it is. We could do a small one like that. I'm just thinking what we run on losing water going down the gutter every... Well, once we get snow, we actually, there's not much, much wastage because it, it freezes quickly. So I, I think, you know, because we used to do liners at my, the previous communities I was in. We, the way we make ice is really efficient, but we need snow. So that's the, it's like it, we were able to freeze it in a hurry once it started snowing. So um, the, the amount of liners you'd need, plastic and stuff, I don't think we want to go that road. The last two Decembers have not been good for ice making. They haven't, yeah. But January's have been great, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all, that's all I have to report tonight. Definitely a busy season, but we're, we're moving into new budget cycle and staying busy. So. How, uh, question for Todd. What, any damage from the storm in December for city trees? or? Um, <clears throat> trying to think. There was this mainly, I think in Buco Park we lost a few trees. It was on the north side of town. Yeah. Um, but nothing. Uh, we lost one really big pine tree. Now that I think about it by the by the ball diamond. Uh, but uh, other than that, there was uh, there wasn't much of anything. So I was happy about that. And there was some private tree damage in different. You know, some of got hit real bad north of. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it shows your uh, pruning efforts are are. are or, or I wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Good job for the city. Yeah, but I wasn't right. going to. No, that, 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 there is, there, there's truth to that. So um, if they're maintained, you oh, shouldn't please. lose as many branches in events like this as you, know, as you did on the homeowner's trees. I should also mention, uh, thank you, I, I forgot, there was a new light pole put in in Piffner Park if you haven't seen it yet. So the mayor uh, worked on this initiative, he really gets the credit for this, but he had made some contacts and through one of the art uh, programs he had been in that he had gotten a grant for, the light pole that's right next to the cultural commons um, is shaped in a way that it's holding an umbrella and it looks like a person essentially and uh, the next phase of it that we hope to do is probably have a bench put underneath there too. So um, it came about quickly and we still may have to look at the area if another light needs to be added because those lights do serve to illuminate the, the pathway, but it's a, it's a nice addition and it's right there in, by the cultural commons. So if you haven't gotten a chance to get down there, uh, please do. It's, it definitely looks really cool in person compared to even the photos. Wasn't there a plan to do along the river? So there's been a couple ideas kicked around about the, the lights along the river. So I, I'm not aware of an official plan of what it would be done, okay. but there's a couple different ideas. One idea that has been brought up or been mentioned a few times is could all of the lights on the river, rather than having what they are in a wood pole right now, match the light lights that are on the bridge that are more historic looking? Issue with that is um, some of the, I guess, counterpoints, like there's no tape on those lights. So there's been talk of, well, do we want those lights to be covered so that they don't spill out? 
So that's one idea that's come up. Um, the other idea I think the mayor mentioned is if it was popular and well received, could more of these artistic lights be along that area? I don't think there's been a, a hardcore plan laid out, but I think it's an idea that's been talked about. I know that is one thing that was a uh, concern that was expressed among the park board members was, yeah, it was too much light pollution along the, yeah, right. along the river too Absolutely. that we would like to minimize that. So if we could get involved sooner rather than later, if they're looking at designs and stuff so that we can try to minimize that light pollution. You bet. Be good. I know it's realized it's only January, but Riverfront Rendezvous is you know, <laughs> a few months away. Any planning or anything that yes, we are under you could be aware of. We are definitely under planning. So the dates this year, the Fourth of July falls on a Monday, so we're set for July first, second, and third. Fireworks will be on the third. I believe that the the like the parade, because that's a little bit separate of the festival, is still going to run on the Fourth of July, but all of our items are going to run through that weekend. So. Um, we will release kind of the headliner. That's the first thing that comes out typically, usually end of January, beginning of February. And then we're still booking back some of the things during the day and stuff. Uh, we'll be bringing back the food truck court because it was really well received last year. Um, we hope to still have the lumberjacks, another really popular item. The inflatables went over incredibly well last year. So those will be back. And then we'll be trying to do some new improvements. There's, we'd love to do some sort of market in the park in a certain capacity if we can, some 10 by 10 tents where people could do some vending during the day. Um, that's the hope for an addition, but I don't want to announce that as an addition because it's not really done yet. But that's, that's one of the things we hope to bring in new this year if we can. That's so uh, the fireworks show, we are potentially working with a new partner. So I hope to have good news on that soon, but that's not finalized. But uh, yeah, we're, we had the best year ever, you know, last year, at least in a really, really long time. So uh, we're hoping that we can take that momentum and carry it for this year. Uh, overall, with the fireworks being shot off from the Central River, that went pretty well, I'm assuming. Went great. They will be back, and we might just, we had a real heavy westerly wind last year, so we did have some, um, I'll call it the exterior of the cartridges or whatever, that kind of blew out that way. So we might move the GPS coordinates slightly closer to Mead, and we have two options in that realm. We'll be working with the fire department. One option is to say if we move more than we, we, we can with the allowable sitting area. We might have to put some small fencing along the bank, so maybe take 10 feet of the park or something for some fallout zone. The other idea is we might be able to shift just enough that the edge would be that way again. Last year where we placed the boats, it was enough to leave the whole park open. But again, if you have a westerly wind, we found out it does throw where most of the people are sitting towards that bank. So we were looking with the fire department and a GPS coordination to just slide them slightly, and that might impact Mead slightly. But we want people to be able to sit in Mead. It was really well received. It gave another alternative for people to go to. Yes, the only complaint I heard was the, the traffic issue. I, I know we can't control the railroads, um, so I don't know if we need to address how the traffic crosses the bridge or one lane or, or whatever, but that seemed to be the only bottleneck was people, there was a train, I guess, crossing West River Drive when people were leaving, so it was a kind of unexpected, I guess the train decided to stop or whatever, their <laughs> you know, our shift was done, and it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant, but. Yeah, anybody that lives on the west side is aware that you're gonna go into town to take your five minutes to get there, make sure you got an extra 15 minutes for a train that stopped there. <laughs> But no, I, I've heard it was very well. It was good. Yeah. You guys did a good job. Yeah, it was great. I did just one thing with the light pole. I know that the mayor was the driving force behind that, but I think it was Andy Voller that yes. actually made it. So I wanted to just give credit to him and great. thank him for doing job. that for us. Yeah. It looks very awesome. <laughs> like some tuna. Yeah. <laughs> Item number 11, adjournment. Motion to adjourn, please. John, okay. I guess. McCurry, one <laughs> second. <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. Seven. A video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos.